night, warning signs for Hillary Clinton. Two new polls showing Bernie Sanders beating Clinton in two crucial states. In Iowa, Bernie Sanders with a five-point lead over Clinton. And in New Hampshire, Sanders now topping Clinton by 14 points. Nationally, her lead over Sanders has dwindled. A new New York Times CBS poll just released moments ago shows Clinton leading Sanders 48 to 41 percent. It is, of course, a lead, but just a month ago, she led Mr. Sanders by 20 percentage points nationally. And Clinton is now using the best weapon she has to fight back, sending daughter Chelsea on the campaign trail today for the first time. I never thought that we would be arguing about the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare in the Democratic primary. Senator Sanders wants to dismantle Obamacare, dismantle the CHIP program, dismantle Medicare, um, dismantle private insurance. So is the Clinton campaign worried? Well, Hillary Clinton sat down with our own Allison Camerata. Secretary Clinton, thanks so much for sitting down with us here in Iowa. Thank you, Allison. So we're in Ames, Iowa. Yes. Where the temperature, as we speak, is one degree. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have been going to countless campaign events here. And I'm wondering, when you get up in the morning in Iowa, if there are ever times that you question your life choices. <laughs> Actually, no. I, you know, I grew up in Chicago. I'm used to cold weather. It doesn't bother me. In fact, I'm somewhat reassured that there is a real winter, uh, that we're actually seeing snow and, and lower temperatures. But I get up every day, whether I'm in Iowa, New Hampshire, wherever I am in the country, and I really look forward to the day because I find the opportunity to go out and listen to people, hear their stories, give them my views about what I think the next president should uh, do very energizing and very, you know, reinvigorating all the time. So let's talk about the tightening race mm -hmm. between you and Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders was speaking to reporters on Monday night here in Iowa, and he said that your campaign is in, quote, serious trouble. Is that how you feel? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, in fact, I have always known that if you're going to run to be president, particularly in the Democratic Party, it's a long, hard, challenging road. And so I've been in these elections before. They always tighten up as people begin to make up their minds, as they look at uh, the candidates. Totally predictable. I feel really, really good about the campaign organization that I have. A caucus is different from a primary. It takes a lot of intensive work to convince people to come out on a cold Monday night, spend a couple of hours in order to stand up for your candidate. But I'm asking Iowans, um, if they'll stand up for me on caucus night, I will be standing up for them uh, all through my presidency. There is a new Quinnipiac poll out just about one hour ago in which uh, Bernie Sanders is now beating you in Iowa. It is 49% to 44%. It's the first time that this has happened, that he's been beating you in Iowa um, since September. We're 20 days out. Does he have more momentum than you? Well, the funny thing, Allison, is after that poll came out, about an hour later, there was a PPP poll where I was leading him by the same margin, about six points up. I don't pay any attention to this. I don't feel that it's a good reflection about who will actually come out on caucus night. I can only tell you that the energy, the enthusiasm, the excitement of my volunteers, my organizers, the voters who come, who sign up on commit to caucus cards is just building. That's my experience. So I'll let people poll and try to figure out who's going to actually show up. I'm looking at people who are showing up, making up their minds, and trying to you know, convince them to come out and caucus for me. Why don't you feel that the polls are a good reflection of what's going to happen in the caucus? Because they're so unpredictable. And it's gotten increasingly difficult to poll. And I think you would have to add a degree of difficulty uh, to polling for a caucus. So that's been my experience. I've watched this a long time. I've had a prior election uh, where I campaigned in Iowa. So I just put that aside. I'll let pundits and others worry about who's up and who's down. I just get up every day, like we were saying, going out there, making my case, drawing the contrast, because I have the highest regard for my two opponents, but there are real differences, and we need a spirited debate, because after the first of the year, a lot more people start paying attention. And now I know it's you know the make or break time. People make up their minds. Bernie Sanders is also winning in New Hampshire, not surprising. He's from the neighboring state. Have you considered what would happen if he wins in Iowa and New Hampshire, what your plan is? I don't think 
about that. I, I'm going to do everything I can to win as big a margin as possible in the caucus, then go to the primary. But this is a national campaign. We have been organizing in South Carolina, Nevada, a lot of the March 1st states, the March 15th states. Remember, I campaigned all the way into June last time. And I have always thought that given the unpredictability and the you know, changes in um, people's concerns going into this election, that we wouldn't know uh, exactly how the outcome would be for you know a couple of cycles of these uh, primaries and caucuses. So I'm going to do my best to convince more Iowans to come out and caucus for me. And even though, as you say, Senator Sanders is a neighbor and a neighbor's never lost in New Hampshire, I'm going to take that uh, challenge on and do the best I can to get people in New Hampshire to support me as well. Vice President Joe Biden offered his thoughts to CNN on why he thinks Bernie Sanders is resonating. He said that he thinks it's about Senator Sanders' positions on income inequality. And the vice president said, quote, it's relatively new for Hillary to talk about that. That's been Bernie's. No one questions Bernie's authenticity on those issues. What's your reaction? Well, the vice president, who I deeply respect and regard as a friend, went on to say, as I recall, but, you know, Hillary Clinton has a lot of very good economic policies that are thoughtful and on and on. Look, I have been working toward closing the gaps between people, poor people and well-off people primarily, all my adult life. I went to work for the Children's Defense Fund. I helped to reform the education system in Arkansas. I was a legal services lawyer defending poor people. I went to work to try to make sure that we got health care in the beginning of uh, my husband's administration because of so many people who were left out and were uninsured. I have been on this issue in many different ways. How do we make education more equal? How do we make health care more equal? Of course, that's tied to income equality, but there is also a broader range of issues that I have a long record addressing. And when I was in the Senate, I took on corporate executive pay, a lot of the abuses that I thought were there. I took on these derivatives and credit default swaps that contributed to the collapse of the economy and the Great Recession. I stood up to Wall Street. I called them out. So I have a very long record. I, I have a broader agenda. It's not the only thing I talk about, because I think you have to view equality of opportunity and how we deliver that in the 21st century from many different perspectives, and that's what I try to do. And since you have been devoting much mm -hmm. of your career to talking about this, why do you think the vice president would say it's more in Bernie's wheelhouse and it's about his authenticity? Oh, I don't know, but I, you know, I have uh, a lot of regard for the vice president, and I think uh, today he clarified what he said and said he was talking about me when I was secretary of state. Well, when I was secretary of state, I couldn't talk about domestic policy. There's an unwritten rule. You do not meddle in domestic policy when you are Secretary of State, or for that matter, Secretary of Defense. So yes, for four years, despite a long career, both in and out of public service, where I have been relentless in talking about these issues, there were four years when I did not. I talked about how we're going to get Iran to the negotiating table and try to prevent them from getting a nuclear weapon, how we're going to you know, deal with a rising China, what we're going to do about women's rights, something that goes to the heart of inequality. So. I had a different uh, agenda because I had a different job. So you didn't take Biden's comments as a slight? No, not at all. Okay, you uh, are introducing your tax plan. One of the headlines is that you would impose a 4% surcharge on incomes over $5 million. And I believe that that would raise about $150 billion over 10 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Does that go far enough in addressing income inequality? Well, we've got a, a variety of proposals. Um, not only the 4% surcharge, which I call the fair share surcharge, the so-called Buffett rule, which would have a minimum tax rate for people making more than a million dollars, limiting deductions to 28% with a charitable uh, exception, going after a lot of the subsidies that, for example, still subsidize the oil and gas industry, about six billion a year, while we have to move toward uh, a clean renewable energy future. So. I have put forth plans, paid family leave, uh, tuition, debt-free tuition for public colleges, uh, capping prescription drug 
uh, costs and much more. And it would cost about $100 billion a year, all of which I pay for. In contrast, Senator Sanders has some very big ideas, but he hasn't yet told anybody uh, how he would pay for them. And he had promised that he would roll out his tax plans before the Iowa caucus on February 1st. Well, if you wait too long, nobody will have a chance to see them or analyze them. And so I am very clear about what I would do and how I would pay for it. Another point of conflict between you and Senator Sanders is on gun policy. Mm -hmm. We just watched this very emotional event yes. this morning uh, that you were involved in where this mom who lost two children right. to gun violence got up and spoke. And it was really heartbreaking to hear her. It sounds like she lost her children to criminals. Yeah. So how would you stop that? This is a very big difference in uh, this campaign because as you saw, I received the Brady campaign endorsement today and both the woman, uh, Delphine Cherry, who introduced us to the stage and the head of the Brady campaign had lost family members. It was really hard standing up there because I have held the hands of and listened to countless people who have lost family members to gun violence. And I agree completely with the president about us having to take action now. We lose on an average 90 people a day. It has to stop, Allison. I've been in this campaign advocating for comprehensive background checks, closing the gun show loophole, closing the online loophole, closing what's called the Charleston loophole. You know, there was a loophole. My opponent voted for it, Senator Sanders, that at the end of three days, business days, you get that gun, whether they have finished the background check or not. The killer in Charleston who bought that gun, if there had just been a little more time, it would have been discovered he should not have been able to buy the gun because he had a federal record. We have saved a lot of lives. I can't put an exact number on it, but because of the Brady Bill, which Senator Sanders voted against five times, more than two million people, the Brady campaign says 2.4 million purchasers have been stopped from buying guns. So we're talking about violent criminals. We're talking about domestic abusers. We're talking about the dangerously mentally ill. We're even talking about terrorists because the Republicans won't close the loopholes so that people on the no-fly zone can buy guns. I feel passionately about this and the accumulation of from Sandy Hook to the community college in Oregon to the fact that we have so many mass killings in the last few years I think it certainly motivated the president, and I am so proud to support him, and I want to make this a voting issue in this campaign. All right, and out front next, Hillary Clinton, ongoing head-to-head -head against Donald Trump. <laughs> yes, it would be amazing, <laughs> and I would look forward to it. And Donald Trump tonight, live at this hour. There he is, addressing the breaking news about Iran holding 10 American sailors. That story, next. Welcome back to a special edition of Outfront. I am live tonight on Capitol Hill. The president is about to deliver his final State of the Union address here tonight. The president giving this speech with an eye on the 2016 election. Tonight, more of Allison Cameron's interview with Hillary Clinton, where she tells us how she really feels about running against Donald Trump. I want to talk about an issue that Donald Trump wants to make an issue in this campaign, and that is our allegations from your husband's past. Mm -hmm. He's going further, actually, than that. He's making it about you. He's saying that you are an enabler of bad behavior and of sexual assault. What's your response to Donald Trump? I have no response. I'm going to let him say whatever he wants to say. He can run his campaign however he wishes. I'm going to keep talking about what the next president will have to do starting January 20th, 2017. I have deep disagreements with what he's proposing. His tax plans would cut trillions of dollars of taxes from the wealthy and corporations. He doesn't believe in equal pay. He thinks that American workers are already making too much. So I'm going to draw the contrast with him that I think the American people are interested in seeing. 
But when someone accuses you of being an enabler of sexual assault, don't you need to respond to it? I mean, particularly since this is an issue that you wanted to talk about on the campaign trail, campus sexual assault. You say that, that survivors need to be believed and they need to be heard. So when he's accusing you of doing something that is the antithesis of what you want to talk about, don't you need to address it? Well, I'm going to let the voters decide what's relevant and what's not relevant in their decision as to who they're going to support. Um, I, we are, I, I have a few more questions <laughs> about your life on the campaign trail that I want to uh, get to. Donald Trump, again, he was on The Tonight Show uh, last night. He was asked about the possibility of you two running against each other, if that's how this all plays out in November. He said that would be, quote, an amazing thing. How <laughs> Yes, it would be amazing, <laughs> and I would look forward to it. You know, I, I, look, I think this is really serious business, and campaigns always have some great stories and great characters. That's part of the political process. This is really serious business, who the next president is. We're either going to build on the progress that we've made, or we're going to see it ripped away. We're either going to defend human rights and civil rights and women's rights and gay rights and voting rights and workers' rights and all the rest that is at stake, or we're going to turn the clock back. And that's why I have tried to very clearly explain where I stand on all of these issues, because the stakes are so high. And if I'm fortunate enough to get the nomination, I will run hard against whomever the Republicans nominate, because they represent a... Um, brand of politics and policies that I think would hurt our country. And I don't want to see that happen. Let's say you get the nomination. Let's say you win the presidency. Yes, let's, let's, say, let's say that. <laughs> let's say it. And on day one, you yeah. walk into the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. What's the first phone call you make? Well, I think the very first phone call would be uh, to whoever I've asked to be the chief of staff of the White House. Let's get a meeting together. Let's get our agenda together. There's a lot that we have to get going. The earlier we start, the better we'll be off and we'll get more accomplished. Because I want to really think hard, um, if I do get the nomination, right then and there, how we organize the White House, how we organize the cabinet, what's the legislative agenda. You know, the time between an election and an inauguration is short. You can't wait. I mean, you can't take anything for granted. You have to keep working as hard as you possibly can. But I think it's important to start planning because we know what happens if you get behind in getting your agenda out, in getting your appointments made. You lose time, and you're not doing the work uh, that the American people elected you to do. Before I let you go, I definitely want to ask you about your granddaughter. I know that you talk about her yeah. on the campaign trail. Yeah. Today is, I, I believe, or recently, uh, Chelsea is making her first appearance yes. on the campaign trail. And she um, said that she believes that you becoming a grandmother is a driving force behind your campaign. How so? Well, she's right. Um, because I feel very fortunate. You know, I, I like to point out I'm the granddaughter of a factory worker who came to this country as a young immigrant, went to work in the lace mills in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So here I am, three generations later, asking people to vote for me to become their president. And we have this amazing 15-month-old grandchild with another on the way uh, next summer. And so I think a lot about the future, but I think not just about her future, because we're going to do everything we can to make sure she has the best opportunities life can offer. But I think about what kind of country she'll become an adult in and what kind of world is going to be out there waiting for her. And I want to make sure it's not just our grandchild, but every child who has the opportunity to go as far to fulfill their God-given potential as possible. And a lot of that depends on the kinds of decisions that our presidents make. It's not, you know, you have to have family support, you have to have community support. I wrote a book called It Takes a Village. I understand that. But do you kids have health care? That's why I created the Children's Health Insurance Program, because too many didn't. Do kids have good education? That's why I'm for early childhood, because too many kids come to school unprepared. How about college affordability? Too many kids are being weeded out because they can't afford it to start or stay. I go through the list of what is really dampening the opportunities that young people in our country have right now, and I want to be the president who unleashes that potential again. And when you think about your grandchildren's future, are you worried or hopeful? I'm always hopeful, Allison. I'm always hopeful. I think this is the greatest country. When I listen to the negative comments made about our country on the campaign stage, 
predominantly by the Republicans. I mean, look at what we've come back from. It was a Republican administration under which we had the Great Recession. That is just a fact. President Obama inherited an economy that was losing 800,000 jobs a month. I don't think he gets the credit he deserves for digging us out and getting us standing again. So I know that choices really matter in politics, but I am absolutely committed to the belief, the conviction that I have that our country is resilient, we're strong, we're smart. Given the right leadership, we can do anything. That's why I actually am quite optimistic and confident about the future. Secretary Clinton, thank you so much. Thank for you, down Allison. With us. Great Pleasure to see you. you. And out front next, Donald Trump live in Iowa at this hour. Tonight, Ted Cruz punching back at him, who is going to win the Iowa prize. And they're taking their seats as we are counting you down to the State of the Union, which will be here on Capitol Hill. Can the president say when the Americans held by Iran will be set free?